Hello everybody and welcome to the Just Passing Through podcast episode 158. I'm back in Japan. I left Manchester on Wednesday last week. Wednesday last week and landed on the Thursday after 30 hours. We did Manchester, Singapore, seven hours in Singapore and then a seven hour flight to Tokyo. Storm Lillian hit England last week. Uh, last weekend, sorry, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Two stages were shut in Leeds. A lot of tents were flying everywhere. Toilets blew over, so there was shit and piss all over the place and a lot of people fucked off at home, rightly so. Now, the big thing was Liam Gallagher were headlining one of those days and there was a cryptic message. Were it cryptic? Maybe not. Um, and it said 28th of... No, 26th of August, 2024, 8am. And that were it. So everybody's going fucking bananas. There's going to be a reunion. There's going to be a reunion. And lo and behold, at 8am that morning, a reunion gig, reunion gigs were announced. Now, before I go into all that, I just want to tell you my Oasis stories. Now, going back to 1994, I'd just left the military. I was in England, in Bradford. I'd got a job for the council. I'd got a, I'd say it's a pretty good job for the council. It were all right. I were driving bin wagons. Now, everybody says, as my mother used to say, as long as you don't grow up to be a bin man, I'm not bothered. And here we are. I were a bin man. But you were getting finished for one o'clock in the afternoon. You were in pub at two. And you weren't having to be back at work until 8 o'clock the following morning. It was fantastic. Now, I can remember being sat in West Bowling around 1993 in a bin wagon. It were pissing it down. I were in cab. There were fellas at the back of the wagon throwing garbage and rubbish in back at back at wagon. And I remember being sat there and people were going on a radio programme to try and win tickets for In Excess in Round Air Park in Leeds. And I remember being sat in that bin wagon thinking, oh God, In Excess are going to have to be my band. Because they were the biggest thing at that time. In Excess, they were all right. There were no wrong with them. But Michael Hutchins were probably one of the best looking men on planet Earth at that moment in time. In excess for a band from Australia. They're a working class band, but from Australia nonetheless. And Michael Hutchins, as a hobby, were just slinging dick into any supermodel that walked past his front door. And they were willingly letting him. I mean, he corrupted Kylie Minogue, for Christ's sake. So, what have I got in common with Michael Hutchins? Absolutely fuck all. Fuck all. So you're sort of thinking to yourself back in 1994, 93, 94, God, I wish somebody would do something because my dad would always talk to me about the 60s and there were some good bands, that obviously it's the Beatles, the Stones, and there was some other good stuff that came out in the late 60s, Credence and all that sort of stuff. So my dad had a wagon to attach himself to. I didn't at that moment and you're thinking oh Christ now like distant thunder you know a gathering storm bands would sort of trickle in now 1991 EMF came out now EMF that Schubert Dip album I recommend you all to go have a listen to that go have a listen to Schubert Dip that album to me I was like, right, this summer here. And then Carter USM, Unstoppable Sex Machine, they came out. Brilliant. But there were just odd bands and there were nobody really there to like the touch paper. And then Suede came out. Now, Suede, a very good band, good songs, Bernard Butler on guitar. And you're thinking, yeah, yeah, this is good. But again, art students from London, from the South, Good band, good music, nothing in common with them. Now, the thing is to connect. I've, I've found this out. To connect, you've got to have all three. 
good music, great band. And you've got to have some sort of similarities to them. You know, the Beatles and the Stones, a great band, but they're art students. Fucking art students. So what possible thing have I got in common with them? Whereas the Who, Roger Daltrey, were just a working class fella. Keith Moon were just some fella that banged on the bongos. I had something in common with them. Great band, good songs, connection. With these other bands, Suede, EMF are from down south. I mean, how connected can you be to somebody from down south? You know, having that easier life than what we did up north. They didn't seem to have that much of a struggle. So you don't have that connection. Then, in 1994, early on, this song called Columbia came out. And I, I sort of heard it on radio in Binwagon. And I caught, I caught the, bat, the last minute of it. What the fuck is that? What is that? So I went down to HMV on the Saturday and I found the single on a tape. I wasn't going to buy it on a, on a record because you can't play records in Cabot Van. So I got it on a tape. And I played that fucker backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, A side, B side, A side, A side, B side, the whole week. What is this? Anyway, I went, they released another song, Supersonic. And I went and got that on cassette.
when I went down that second time to get Supersonic on cassette, there was a poster up in HMV and it was a picture at Brothers and it said the release date for the album. August 29th, 1994, so back end at summer, which makes that... Fucking hell, we're on 28th today. So it's 30 years tomorrow. 30 years tomorrow, definitely maybe we released. So I went down there on the 29th of August and bought it. I bought it on tape and I bought it on record because I knew it was going to be good. I had my Walkman with me, my little black Walkman. I got it. I put the record in my backpack and I put the tape in my Walkman. I had six batteries. My Walkman took two HP7s. I had six batteries on me and then... I walked home up Manchester Road and I listened to an album that changed my life. If there's one album in my life that changed my life, it's that one. It's that one I'll go back to. It's that one that I'll get people to play at my funeral. It is a game changer. So the 29th of August, you've got a 23-year-old walking up Manchester Road, out of Bradford, listening to his Walkman, looking at what I can remember being blue sky for a fucking change, thinking, oh yeah, my my life's changed now. My life has completely changed now. It's as if the world were on a different axis. It really was. Somebody, the gunpowder that had been piled up with the MF... The Stone Roses, Suede, and uh, Carter, USM, and all all those bands, that gunpowder that had been piled on top of each other had just been lit. And Oasis had just thrown a fucking flare. They'd not come with a match. They'd not come with a lighter. They'd come with a fucking flare and thrown it on that pile, and it had gone boom. It had gone fucking boom. Now, by the time I got home, I think I'd listened to that album three times. And by the time I walked in my front door, um, it was playing a lot slower because I'd run out the first set of batteries because I would just turn it and turn it and turn it and turn it and listening to every track. And you were thinking to yourself, that were a great track, I'm going to rewind it, let's just listen to the next one. Fucking hell, that's fantastic. And every one of them were a fucking banger. Every one of them were a banger. Now, I got home and I played it to the fella I was living with. I said, listen to this. Fucking listen to this. Played it. And it oh, I don't, I don't, no, it's not for me. Not for me. I said, are you fucking mad? Are you fucking crazy? And he wasn't having any of it. He wasn't having any of it at all. It turns out a few years later, he sort of come round. But I were fucking banging that drum as soon as I told all my friends buy this album, buy this album. All my friends bought the album. There were only one or two dissenting views to that. That summer had come to a close. So you were coming into Christmas time. And then the album just fucking blew up. Everybody my age, men, women, early, late, mid-twenties, had got that album in some shape or form in their house. Running up to Christmas, you'd go out drinking on a Saturday and a Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the jukeboxes. I don't know what Owen Morris had done to that to that recording, or definitely maybe, but all those tracks just seemed to play a lot louder in the pubs than any other track on any other jukebox. It was just louder. Everything was just louder. So there must have been... Thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds spent on jukeboxes in pubs just because people wanted to listen to that album. So it gets to Christmas time and I went over to Dublin for New Year. Dublin for the New Year. If you ever get a chance, do it. Just do it. So we went over to Dublin. There were four of us. And the fucking... Irish were as into it just as much as we were. Just as much as we were. 
It were everywhere, that album. Absolutely everywhere. So while I'm in while I'm in Ireland, I bought a copy of the NME. I always choose to read the NME. Um, and there it was. Sheffield Arena. Sheffield Arena, April 20-something. I'm thinking 24th. April 24th, 1995. It was definitely April 95, that's for sure. And the gig were on. And I, I said to myself, I have got to get to that gig. So it were New Year, that would have been New Year's Eve uh, 94, going into 95. I got home, couldn't get a ticket for Love No Money, and then TNA, Telegraph and Argus, had put on a coach trip with ticket, and I bought myself one. I should have bought a couple for my mates, but I went on my own. Anyway, I got down there, I got pally with some folk on bus, and our seats, so if you ever go to Sheffield Arena, it's an ice, it's built for ice skating. Sheffield Steelers or Sheffield Panthers, I think, the ice hockey team, I'm not sure. But if you look at an ice hockey pitch, rink, an ice hockey rink, I would be looking down there and the stage where Oasis were playing were off to my right. So I'd have to turn 90 degrees to look at the stage. So I got in there and they came on. Came on, played the first, played the first track.
We're looking down onto the floor and the floor was split into two. So there were the people at the front, there were a barrier and the people at the back. And I thought, I can't stay here for this gig. I'm getting over on, I'm getting over on that floor. So I jumped down, I jumped over a bit and I jumped over again and got into the back part. And I wanted to get, I couldn't get through to that front part. And then Liam Gallagher said, get rid of that fucking barrier. So that barrier were moved and we all flooded in to the front. And I watched the rest of that gig from front and it was fantastic. Fantastic. It was Tony McCarroll's last gig and it was the first time that uh, Noel Gallagher had ever played Don't Look Back in Anger. Now, they were all complaining about his little acoustic set that he got in the middle. He played two or three songs in the middle of that gig, and as he did with every gig at that time. And it was just him solo with an acoustic guitar. Everybody was singing along with it. Lights were in the air. And it was were, it were fun, but you just wanted the band to be back on stage and kicking ass and back to come on. And it was just a time and a place. The Verve was supposed to be supporting them, but Richard Ascroft, had, I don't know if it, it, it were an overdose or it, it were just fucked. Um, he, they were blowing up at the time as well. And I think he were just, he'd just gone to a bit, gone, gone in excess of summer and they couldn't play. So hometown group, Pulp jumped in. So Pulp were supporting, Oasis were main billing. And Jarvis Cocker got that hometown crowd up and running, ready for Oasis, and we were all ready for it. Now, it comes to the end of the gig, off the go, they come back on, they do two or three for the encore, and they went. I've said this a thousand times before. That was their first mega gig where they were headlining. They'd played festivals before, but obviously at a festival, everybody's seen bands every, every hour. But this was their gig, and this was their first big gig. Now, I'm not sure that the band knew how big they were going to be, because after it all finished, the band walked off, the lights came down, and I'm seeing, I'm seem to remember the people were taking down the stage because it was a one night only thing. But that might not be right. I might be thinking of that wrong. But the room were clearing. The floor were clear and everybody were going and getting the buses back home to Bradford or wherever they'd come from. And Noel Gallagher come back out and he had this red, white and blue striped shirt on. And he were looking at the floor clearing and he just went down on his own. He went on his knees, were down on his own. She's just looking and thinking. And I like to think that that was the moment he knew we were gonna, they were going to be fucking world beaters. Because we all knew, everybody on that floor knew that these fuckers were going to be big. And I don't think he knew until then. And then, that 94, 95, 96, so, What's the Story came out. So you've got, definitely, maybe, What's the Story. Fuck me. Fuck me. They, they made the sun shine on the worst February day possible when it were pissing it down, when it were cold, when it grey sky, you're fucking soaked. You're absolutely soaked. You would listen to any track on any one of those two albums and you were already in a better mood. A much better fucking mood. I don't know, it was like a, like fucking fairy dust had been, had been sprinkled. It really was. So, the, those, those two albums were great. And then... BA now. Hmm. Now, when BA now came out, I mean, it's unfortunate, but I went to see him again for the second time on that tour, and obviously, kilos and kilos of cocaine had been snorted, you know, bottles full of pills had been swallowed, gallons of alcohol had been drunk, you know, thousands of women had been fucked. And they'd just lost their appetite for it. They'd got comfortable. And that's all it was. And every anybody and everybody I know would have done the exact same. And they just didn't have it. And it would when that album came out, right, 
the party's over, we're done. And that's when I left England because I knew that party were over. For those three years, 94, 95, 96, it got into 97, 97 you knew, yeah, it's done, it's done. But those three years, 23, 24, 25, I was 24, 24, no, 23, 24, 25, and a little bit of 26, those three and a half years, I hit that period of time perfectly. My timing was perfect for that scene, for Britpop and for Oasis. And when BA Now came out, right, I'm gone. And I mean, other Standing on the Shoulders of Giants came out and then that other one which were on the, the album cover with them Garage Doors. I were, I were away then. I couldn't even tell you any tracks off any of them albums. But those first two brilliant absolutely brilliant and it was just a period of time just a period of time now the reunion gig there are i've looked there are a number of gigs and the, these gigs just seem to be in the uk and the republic of ireland you've got london manchester uh, murrayfield is a, a couple in Wales and then Dublin, right? Am I going to go? I'm going to be home in summer. I don't think I'm going. I don't think I'm going. I mean, I saw them twice in England. That first gig in Sheffield, fantastic. The definitely maybe tour. Then I saw them again, the BA now. Not so good. I saw them again in, I saw twice in Japan at Summer Sonic. Summer Sonic were good because it was my first festival in Japan. But there were some other good good bands that were on there, but Oasis were headlining. They were all right. They were all right. I got backstage for that. The second one in 2009, I went to see with my mate Simon in December. I remember being at the back of that gig thinking, God, I wish this were over now. This is rubbish. Absolute fucking garbage they hated each other you could tell they hated each other because you could see the chemistry on stage and I thought yeah they're not going to be long of this world and then it turns out in Paris a few months later it all went tits up and they split up and that was 15 years ago now I would if if it were me and it isn't I'm not a musician I don't play a, I don't play in a band I'm never going to experience the highs and the lows that they've experienced. But looking at it from an, out, from an outsider's point of view, with hindsight, which is a fantastic thing, I would have given it all up around 97, 98 and just stepped away. I mean, the Beatles went on for seven years. They stepped away. They never got back together. And look how revered they are now. But we've got these gigs coming up. Now, I would not want to go and watch them in England. If they do the world tour like the Stone Roses did and they come over to Japan, I'll come and see them here. I'll watch them here. I'll take the family to go watch them here. But to go watch them in, in England with people my age who are trying to relive the youth, you know, seeing a 50-year-old snort cocaine or seeing a 50-year-old try it on with another 50-year-old trying to... It's, that's not for me. That's not for me at all. So, but I think to watch them over here would be somewhat special. But England, I'm not know if if they're gonna do, if they're gonna do their own gigs in in the summer, are they gonna get a chance to get over here and do Summer Sonic or Fuji Rock? If they do that, I'll go and watch them there. They might come over in in the winter, and do some inside venues. I don't know. I don't know if they've still got the traction here that they had in the 90s, that they had worldwide in the 90s. I don't, I'm not sure. But to go and watch them with a load of fat chabs in England who are reliving the youth, it were timing for Oasis. They timed it just fucking right. It was just there. There was a pile of fireworks and gunpowder and petrol, and it just needed just a fucking spark from a match or a flare to let it go boom, and they had it. They had the big fucking petrol bomb, the Molotov cocktail, 
to just throw on that pile. And it went worldwide and everybody were into it. Everybody were into it. Everybody wore their hair different. Everybody dressed different. You know, and to be from the north of England and to be a lad that likes to drink and smoke and pull women, just like they did, to have them as the top band in the UK and shall we say around the world were great. It's like having Tyson Fury as the heavyweight champion of the world, having a northerner in a position where you never where northerners aren't supposed to be. Northerners from council states aren't supposed to um, attend that position. We're not supposed to get there and yet they're the war. They're the fucking war. Now to re have, a, have a reunion fucking you're just doing it for money. I think. You're just doing it for the money. Now, it might be a mythical number with as many zeros as I've never seen. You might be going for that, but if you've already got that much money, is it really worth it? You know what? It's like going back with your ex. You think that ex that you had 15 years ago, when you look back, the, the, the sex were good, you had a good time, but you split up about summer. But when you look back, I mean, I had this Japanese girlfriend 15 years ago. Oof, Jesus Christ. And I'm just remembering the good stuff, but we obviously split up about summer. Imagine getting back with that chick now. It would take about two or three months before you realize, ah, this is why I split up with you. But it looks like with these tour dates, they're only giving themselves a month and a half together. So they might not have a chance to piss off each other. So it'd be like having an affair with your ex-girlfriend. I think you're already with your wife, but you're just going back for a bit extra and then you're getting out. It might be a bit like that. But, I mean, I hope it goes well for them. But it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same as when I saw him in 95. It really isn't. But here we go. I hope they do well. They brought so much fun to the 90s when it were bleak. It were gonna, the, the 90s seemed like it was going to be bleak and they brought it and made it fucking fun. It was fucking fun because of them. And they're back. They're going to be back next year, 31 years after Definitely Maybe were released. 30 years tomorrow. That album got released. So 30 years ago tomorrow I was in Bradford by indefinitely maybe there's a lot of water gone under the bridge since then and here I am in the middle of nowhere in Japan two kids Japanese wife the fucking shit I've done in that last 30 years if I bookmark it we definitely maybe and it only got better from that day 30 years ago, the 29th of August, 1994. Anyway, I'm going to leave you with that and I'll see you when I see you. Adios, everybody. Thank you for listening.